afternoon, fellow teachers. I'm Maria Machen, and I would like to share with you one of the most important things that you will be doing this school year, and that is classroom expectations and engagement. Classroom expectations and engagement. I've made another acronym, CE and E. And so this presentation is talking to the teacher that's interested in receiving more information about engagement, receiving more information about building community, and all of that goes into classroom management. So I feel that if you have your expectations and um, you are engaging your students with a great lesson plan, that classroom management will kind of fall into place. So that's what I'm here talk to talk to you about today. Um, good classroom management is about developing trust. So it's all about trust with your students. Students feel more secure if they know what to expect from you. Do you remember a time when you felt embarrassed, humiliated even, by a teacher um, from your past that you didn't even know what you did wrong or you didn't even see it coming. I have been there and um, it's often hard to recover from that and the relationship oftentimes gets broken. So it's very important to establish this trust. Um, get to know them. How did they learn best? Find out their interests and you can start working that into your lessons um, take time to nurture those relationships every day. Ask them questions about what new information they've given you. Or it could be as simple as asking, what do you think? Some of our students don't ever get asked, what do they think? And that makes them feel more important and better, and they should feel better about themselves. So I'm opening up the top drawer. I wasn't even really going to talk about this, but classroom expectations... Um, and norms do need to be discussed in your class. And I know that sounds silly, but I like, I do mine just a little bit differently than I did when I first started teaching. I kind of establish the expectations and norms, the older students anyway, um, with the class through play. So we do a lot of games. We do um, a lot of fun stuff in the beginning. And then I start to see how personalities, um, what their personalities are like. I start to see who are the leaders in the class. I start to see who are the support team in the class. Who's the support? Um, and who might need a little more encouragement? And then, you know, after that, I start thinking about discussing the expectations and norms with them. So that's kind of how I do it. Um, but once you get to the point, um, you want to come up with your classroom's expectations and norms. The first thing I do is decide what are my non-negotiables. So in other words, what is it that I absolutely cannot have happening in my classroom? And I start there. So one of the things with me is respect. So I have to know that everybody is being respected and that people are being respectful when they talk. So um, another thing is like, it could be as simple as I don't, you know, when we're in person, I don't allow a cell phone to be out. So that's a non-negotiable. Um, so eventually you want to take time for those expectations. Again, play community building games. They, um, they develop your culture in your class and uh, trust and again a leader emerges students get to know each other and you get to know them so i have examples of community building type activities in projects and i also have them in um, exits and kind of throughout this presentation so i'm kind of trying to teach you classroom expectations and norms through engagement with your students so i hope you like that so I also have an example of an older version of my expectations and norms before we went to remote learning just to kind of give you a starting place. So openers, let's start with openers since we are at the beginning. Um, 
So I'm going to talk about four things here. One is Jamboard, two is your learning target, C is agenda, and topic D is enrichment. So first things first, Jamboard. Jamboard is um, an extension or an app, I guess, an application that you can get. Um, and it's almost like a bulletin board. So you can pose a question or have a writing prompt, have students answer it on a um, post-it note and just stick it up on the board. You can do this while you're waiting for people to join your Google Meet. You can do this while waiting for people to join your Zoom. And it's an excellent way for the quieter, the kids that don't express themselves verbally in class to engage. So you start to see and hear them more. So, and it doesn't have to do with content all the time. It's great if you want it to do with content, but one way to build community is to ask them a question just about their favorite things. So like, what's your favorite emoji or how are you feeling today? So I always give them a choice in what they can answer because maybe they don't feel like telling you how they feel today. Maybe they'd rather just show you their favorite emoji. So this allows them a little creativity and a little choice and a little voice. So Jamboard, learning targets. So learning targets, I know you know this, but I can't express how important it is that they're well thought out, that they are displayed throughout the course of the lesson for the entire time in a place where students know to find it. And when students ask you the question over and over and over again, during the lesson, which they will ask it over and over and over again, what are we doing today? What are we doing today? What are we doing today? Instead of telling them and giving them the answer, you're going to show them where to find it. So you can say it over and over and over again if you want, but you're going to reach a point in your teaching where you're like, I am over this. You should know what you're doing today. I've said it five times. So instead of getting mad, refer to the slide, the bottom of the slide is basically what I said, the learning target. Um, if you don't know or understand, ask a friend in your group, ask a person in your group. And then if you still don't understand, ask me. So um, I have an example of the learning target um, in an NTI slideshow. So I'm just going to click on that and go to it just to kind of give you more information about how I like to set up my slides. Um, this is for NTI and I'm just going to keep it. Um, I'm not going to open it in Google Slides because this is just faster. Um, but I have the week up here because we did it by week. We met with our classes once a week. You could put the date up there, the day. And I like to put what week we're in. So if they go to Google Classroom and they go to Classwork, those of you Google who's Google Classroom, they know just to look under week three for this lesson. Um, and so this is the uh, learning target underneath here. And they always know that's where they find it. So this week I will complete my written and oral representation demonstrating understanding about post COVID-19 international trade. So that's a mouthful and they understand what that means because this is a project involving this. So if I were just to like give them this learning target out of the blue, that would be really confusing for them. But I've kind of built up to this a little bit. So as you can see, it's week three. So, um, so anyway, this is, my learning target and I can't express how important it is that you have one that's well thought out and you display it. Next things next is the next thing rather is the agenda. Um, the agenda, it basically lets your students see the sequence of instruction, how you're going to show them um, the plan for the entire period. I often return to the first slide for them to reference after my lecture. So that first slide, as you can see, contains the learning target. Let me go back to this, if I can find it. And it contains the agenda. So the agenda is right here. So it's kind of a roadmap to how we get to the learning target. And this is all done in language that my students understand. They understand that you know, we're going to review the slideshow that the giant slideshow that they helped me to create. So that's something we did prior to. Um, I'm going to tell them what the Eagle Challenge is. 
we are going to have them have time to work on project three deliverables. And then the last but not least, they need to do the Google form check in exit. And that's for me to check for understanding. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close out of this and go back to my slideshow. So we have talked about agenda. And for some reason, my face isn't popping up, but that's OK. You don't need to see me. Now let's talk a little bit about enrichment. So enrichment is something you always need to have something to do for those who finish early. You will have four to five kids that finish early and they're going to be bored. So you need to provide them with this. You will be shocked at how many kids will do it once you get them in the habit of doing it. Um, if you need to incentivize, incentivize it, by all means. But I am surprised at how they will do it for just so they, the wealth of knowledge. I mean, it really helps to teach those kids the value um, intrinsically of what is valuable about knowledge. So it also keeps them busy. And this leads to happy kids, happy teacher, happy administrator. Um, I use the Eagle re Reading Eagle Challenge, which the Eagle, Eagle is our mascot. Sorry, let me to repeat myself a million times. Um, so the Eagle Challenge is what I we call it. And they can have their choice between a Socrative, which we'll go over later, reading one of three articles. And um, according to how your school wants to organize their writing, um, I have them answer these two questions. Give a summary of new information about this article, three sentences. And number two, explain how this information has changed the way you think, your perspective, or how it may change things in the future. So that's just what I do. You do what you do. You do what's important to you. Okay, now moving on. We're going to talk about discussions. So um, when I started teaching 100 years ago, I would a lot of times just think, oh, okay, this part of the class, I'm going to discuss monetary policy. And then I would just plop down and ask a question and expect them to have an intelligent discussion about it. Our kids are amazing in so many ways, but sometimes they need a little help with organizing their thoughts. So these are ways that students can organize their thoughts. So I'm going to talk about video ant, two minute grid, four square and the activity conference table. So the first thing is video ant. So for example, this you would use this if you were assigning a video and then you said, okay, we need to discuss these four things about the video as a class. Well, or if you're teaching in a remote environment, this is a perfect activity for that because it gives actual timestamps as where you are in the video and the prompt, the writing prompt that goes with it. It's a really cool, um, way to for students to organize their thinking and to be prepared to answer questions for the discussion. And I've included a video on how to use it. Um, super easy. I have not used it yet. I was just told about it from one of my fellow teachers, Angie Impelizari, and she's just had really good luck with it. And I trust her opinion. So um, try video ant. Two minute grid, real easy, quick activity two minutes, set the timer. One thing all of a sudden that it became clear to you or a light bulb moment, moment, one thing you want to make sure not to forget that you've learned, one thing that could make, could be made better. And one thing you still have a question about. So you could, for this example, I was referring to the project we were working on. Um, we do this in class just on a piece of paper, but in a remote environment, you could have them create a Google slide turn it into the assignment unemployment names as they appear in the grade book date and period number make it official and always remind them to turn it in for credit then when you go to the class discussion you can look at some of their answers prior to and you can see which students had the strong answers 
which students had that eh, could use a little work and which question, which students had that you or just don't you don't understand enough about this yet. So when you meet to discuss the next time, you ask those students who know who really grasp the understanding to speak first. And oftentimes I'll even send them a little note. Hey, would you mind starting off the discussion and me asking you a question first? You gave an excellent answer. Half the time they're they're very complimented and they want to do it. Okay, now Foursquare. Foursquare is, sounds like a lot of fun, I know, with the ball kind of four squares on the sidewalk, but it's a little bit different, but still fun. You create a table and you write four details or about anything, four details about the project, four details about monetary policy, four details about unemployment as it pertains to your topic. So I like to do a lot of jigsawing in my class. So I divide up the content between groups and make them responsible for sharing it with others. So that's what I did with this Foursquare. I think this was over some of the performance indicators we were reviewing. So write four details about the project as it pertains to your topic. What are three pieces of evidence that you have that represents your topic? List two products or services that can be associated with your topic. Write one to five sentence summary that describes what makes your topic special. So this would take a little bit of time and then continue on. Same as I said with the two minute grid check the answers, see who has the strong answers, start with those students. Conference table. Now this one is my favorite. Okay. My favorite. You are going to set up a professional conference experience for your students. You are going to teach them how to be in a meeting respectfully and how to talk one at a time and listen to others. All these things with this activity. So this is actually kind of like a modified Socratic circle, except it's more about a business meeting. So sets up a professional conference experience for your student. This is one way you could set it up. You can do many different ways of setting it up. And I'm going to show you the slideshow that um, I used a little bit of my friend Rachel Fredowich's uh, slideshow and uh, included my own. So basically here's what you do. I This is my example. I was coming up with a lesson to teach interns about job hazards on their job. Teenagers tend to get hurt a lot because they're not familiar with the potential hazards of their job. So. I choose five students out of my class. I set them in a conference table. If I can't physically do that, then they're in a pretend conference table on a Zoom or a Google Meet. They look at the picture that I will show them on the slide. They review the questions that I've provided for them ahead of time. One of those five takes the lead. The rest of the students are listening quietly they pose a question from the paper, then they slide any object across, any kind of talking object, could be a talking stick, could be a teddy bear, I recommend something boring like a tissue box, slide it across the table to someone else, now they answer the question and ask another one, okay, and then go back to three. So before you give the activity, you just kind of tell them with this slide, you have to demonstrate participation. That's the thing. This is done through a combination of one writing answers or two sharing out loud with the group. So you, if you're not in the conference, you're one of those five, then you need to be writing everything that you hear. Okay. So this kind of just tells them how to set it up. Rachel's really good about, um, showing them specifically how she wants them to set up their paper. And you could say, do the same for a Google Doc. This is an example of one of Rachel's students, their conference table activity questions, what they heard answered. And then you just show them things like, okay, maybe you show them the slide, dangerous unguarded machinery, and you have a list of 10 questions regarding job hazards um, in front of them 
the first person that takes the lead asks one of those questions, then hands it off to, you know, the next person, the next student, and they answer the question. Then you show them um, something else. What could go wrong here? <laughs> Here's another thing. What could go wrong? So just kind of have fun with it. And uh, but it does teach them respect. It does teach them one at a time and how to listen. And you can even change out people. So if they've already given a question or an answer, boop, they can go out and somebody else can come in. Just however you want to play it. So that is conference table. Now, ooh, now we're to games. Okay, so discussion was fun, but games are even more fun. I think that most of you have heard of a lot of these games. Kahoot, uh, GimKit was new to me this year. Read, write, think's been around forever, but I still like it, tried and true. And then Socrative. So the first one's the Kahoot. Hopefully most of you have used Kahoot before. If not, super simple to put together. You just have to create a quiz or use someone else's quiz. You actually can share them with other people. I've shared one with you right here. Um, kids can play it during a class meet even. I played this on a class meet, and but it's important to have two devices. Okay, I will tell you that. I run it with one device and watch it on another device. Be sure to turn the volume off um, or you'll have a ton of feedback. So I've got an example here, the role of finance. Um, and this is just the Kahoot I created. And you can create them just by clicking that, putting in your questions and answers. You can put pictures in. Um, you can do all kinds of fun things. So if, and I think my picture is right here where I would push play, but you would just hit play and people would join with the code. I do recommend the two-step pro process for joining with the code because there is a glitch. Some kids know how to make it kind of glitch out. So have them do a two-step process of joining the, the game and then have fun. So that's Kahoot. Next thing is GimKit. And this looks like it was made by Kahoot people. Um, it kind of looks like this. You put in questions and answers and it's super cool in that they can level up. They can earn points and money and buy more opportunity to win. So it's a little bit of strategy involved, more strategy than Kahoot. Um, I recommend not doing any longer than five minutes. Five minutes is a long time to be playing this game on a Google Meet. So it's a great thing to do when people are first coming in to um, your Google Meet. And as they come in, join the GIM kit. You have to do a little prep work prior to, like they have to join the class, the GIM kit class that you create. But um, once they get in, it's super easy. It's just kind of like Kahoot with the code. You can even use something as easy as read, write, think. You know, if you don't have time to put together a fancy schmancy game, go to read, write, think and put together a crossword puzzle. There's even some out there like about online research. We all could use a little help with that. Have students do this while they're waiting others to join your class meet. Students can guess the answers like one across in the chat or just through speaking out. Okay. Um, I recommend the chat. I don't know. I just think that, you know, sometimes, I don't know. I mean, it's up to you, but sometimes I feel like, you know, the ones that talk the most are the ones that talk the most. And so the, they're the only ones that give answers. But if you say it's just restricted to chat, then, you know, others tend to join the quieter ones. Uh, have a recorder of the class, a recorder class, the student who gets the most right. I think I put that wrong. Sorry. Um, so have a class recorder and have them decide um, the student that gets the most right. Okay, Socrative is another great little app that you can use. You can do quizzes with this on their own. You can assign them, they can do them at home, or you can do something really fun with your whole class, and that is a space race. So these little guys right here are the different teams. You can separate them into um, four or five different teams. They answer the questions as quickly as they can, as correctly as they can. 
and each team you will see will one will win um, will cross the finish line first so I put an example here of a Socrative Microsoft ribbon this is just you know for Microsoft Office um, these are all my quizzes actually so you're seeing all my stuff remind me later okay so these are the questions, the answers. You can put um, images as well. You just would go to launch, and then it's called a space race. And then um, tell them which quiz you want to use. Super easy. And then number of teams that you have. And then it'll start. And my face is in the way. Sorry about that. There we go. But you'll start seeing this progress meter go across. So the ones that get the most right uh, and the fastest will win. So it's kind of fun. Kind of encourages teamwork. All right. So moving on. Let's talk a little bit about projects. Okay. So all these things I'm telling you, I'm not telling you to overwhelm you. I'm telling you because classroom management is so much more than the first day i'm going to tell you my norms and expectations it is daily engaging your students and teaching them how you expect them to act during the class projects are a great way to do this as well they teach them time management they give them choice and voice they have various products that they can produce creativity is encouraged and you establish group roles. So let's talk first about time management. Our students, my students, this is where they struggle with a lot because they tend to be procrastinators. Not all of them, some of them get on the ball and get it done quickly. But I would say one of the biggest challenges I have is getting them not to procrastinate. So um, using projects in your class teaches them time management, okay? Um, students will learn how to manage their time. It gives them a say in how they utilize their time with your guidance. And that's key. You have to guide them without coming right out, trying not to come right out and tell them how to do it. So you can see in this image right here, I had my um, pathway class, my uh, school pathway class where I was teaching them about the different pathways in Eastern High School. One of the pathways is High School of Business. We did a culminating project. It has four parts. Survey week one, cereal box design week two, presentation week three, and the video week three. Oh my gosh, you can do lots of things with your time for three weeks, right? How are you going to take this on? How are you going to manage your time with this? Um, like I said, you don't just want to just show them this one slide and say, go for it. Not at all. Each day you take little bits and you um, help them to break it down and help them come up with that timeline. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is choice and voice. This is extremely important because we all are better at some things than others. We're more confident in some things than others. So you need to give students a choice. So in the same project that I was just referring to, where they were doing the survey, um, they kind of have choice as to what kinds of survey questions they want to ask. Um, with guidance, I give them sources to look at for how to write good survey questions. They read those. That's a part of the lesson. Then they may try writing one or two survey questions on a Google form. They submit the Google form into Google Classroom, sharing the link, and they share the survey with friends and family. They need to get 10 responses by a certain time, by a deadline. So you do give them deadlines, and they try and meet those deadlines along the way. Trust me, they'll get better at this. It gets, it's very frustrating at first with some classes, but as you go along, um, their time management gets better. So, but choice and voice, you always want to give them a choice. And I'm going to show you another way you can give them a choice in their final products. So 
for this, um, I gave the students a choice to doing a PowerPoint presentation or they can do a Flipgrid. And students will naturally gravitate to different vehicles for delivery. So here's an example of a project with two different products. I'm just going to click on this. And here I am again. Hi. Uh, OK, so here's option one. Create your PowerPoint slideshow or and then I dot dot dot. See the next slide. So with this slideshow, I tell them kind of what I want them to include and a type of rubric next to each bit of things that they need, bits of information that they need in their slideshow, or they can do a video. So this shows them how they can do a Flipgrid. Some kids are really good at talking and explaining themselves and explaining their idea. They still need to have that information in the video. They still need to talk about all of these things and show these things, but it's just a different vehicle for doing it. Okay. Okay, group roles. So you will see these roles naturally happen. However, it's really good to let the team try and pick the roles if possible and let them agree upon them. Now, that's not always gonna work. They're gonna need you kind of guiding them, just like I said, throughout this whole process. Projects are really, you know, when you start PBL, and I love project-based learning, it is very, um, it, it's, to be really good at it, it's it's uh, takes several years, I would say, because you don't want to tell them what to do, but you do you do have to sometimes guide them in the right direction. So um, I do that a lot by asking questions. Um, but here's some possible group roles for each of the members: team leader, a rubric master, so important. That's the person that makes sure you're hitting all the marks on the rubric. A task manager, that person who's not a procrastinator, that monitors the project calendar, keeps track of who's responsible for each task, documents progress. Teacher liaison, someone who communicates with me, so they're all not asking me questions. You just ask the question of the teacher liaison and they ask me. And group editor, so they proofread all the slides, images, written products, and they can even come up with their own roles if they want. These are flexible. All right, so last but not least, I would like to talk to you a little bit about um, exits. So exits, and these can be used at various parts of the lesson. Um, 911 call, all on board, elevator pitch and tell me more. So um, again, my friend Rachel made this slide. Isn't it cute? Um, it's a 911 call. So basically, you have to give the typical 911 information in four minutes. So for this particular time, we had them do it as it related to their project that they were working on. So who are you? Where are you? What you have observed and what you need. So it's really funny to see what the kids come up with this. They come up with all kinds of things. And I always get a bit of information that I had no idea. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize they didn't understand this. So this is a great in-person thing, just on a post-it note, leave it behind before you leave the room. This is how you exit my class. You cannot leave until you do this. Or you can make this like uh, comments in a Google Classroom during your Google Meet. All on board, individually write three next steps for the group. So, okay, you're here. Now, how are you going to get there? So what are your three next steps? That's a lot to think about. Compare those three next steps as a group and then come to a consensus as to what should happen next. Elevator pitch. This is a quick pitch and you actually only give them three minutes, but you give them a lot of guidance. The group has to prepare a 30 second pitch develop a clear, brief message or commercial about your project. Um, ideas for the pitch include, see, this is where the guidance comes in. It should communicate your topic, what you've accomplished, what you're still looking for, and how you can benefit class from the information in the presentation. And then look at some of the ones that you think are strong. Maybe you have them write it at first and then the strong ones you ask them if they would mind sharing their elevator pitch the next time. 
and they'll say yes or no, but most likely they'll say yes. Um, tell me more. This is something I've used for an entire class period before, and it was really fun. Um, each group comes up with five W's and an H for a particular topic. So I jigsaw a lot in my class. So for example, if I have a project and I know I've got to cover five essential standards, five performance indicators, let's say, that's a lot. And they don't want to hear me talking this long, right? This is a long time to talk. They don't want to hear me lecturing every day. Assign each group a different performance indicator. Have them come up with five W's and an H. So who, what, where, when, why, and how. Um, have them share out with the group. You could have them put it on a poster. You could have them do a Google Draw. If you were teaching remotely, you could have them do a Jamboard. Once we get breakout rooms in Google Meet, I will be so happy because you can have them actually meet with their groups and then come back to the big group. And that's fantastic. So activity, tell me more. Um, that is all that I had for you. Let me see if I pop up here again in my little corner. Uh, maybe not. Okay, so I'll just go back to Loom. If you guys have any questions, I would really love to hear from you. I'd love to hear your feedback for my video, whether or not it helped. I worry about it being too much. Um, hopefully you can just go back and kind of reference it. And by the way, I made the video using Loom, which I use all the time for videos in my class. And kids love it because if they miss the Google Meet, because let's say they have to work or whatever, um, maybe someone's sick in their family, maybe they are teaching their little sister or little brother um, at the same time you're meeting, they can go click on a link in my Google Classroom watch the Google Meet in its entirely when, entirety when they get a chance. And even those people who are at the Google Meet who are just completely spaced out and not listening, they can go back and they can, they can watch the Google Meet at another time when they're feeling more receptive. So that is all I had for you today. I'm going to see if I can stop this now. My stop sharing, I think it's right here. Okay, I just found my stop sharing. So I hope you guys have a wonderful summer, the rest of it. Um, thanks so much for listening. I really, really appreciate you being here. I hope this helped. Um, and I hope I didn't talk too much. Bye.